Welcome to a video version of the command day that uh, I have been running for a number of years now for new commanders. Uh, it had been a proposal for some time that we should try and video one of these days, put it on disc in order to provide the opportunity for people to look at some of the content of the course to help prepare for their own command course ahead of time and, uh, and we haven't been able to do that. It's always an amusing part of working for a company the size of British Airways that we couldn't seem to make this happen. So what I've decided to do is to take some of this time that I'm having on sick leave to try to put together a series of discs that will enable you to uh, see the sorts of things that we discuss on this command day in, if you like, the privacy of your own home. So to that end, I think that it's important that you realise that there are some serious shortcomings in doing this. Firstly, if we were in a group 10 people in a classroom or more, then to a great extent I act like a set of traffic lights. And the reason is, as people come into the room, I put up on the board here the time spent from the first time they climbed in an airplane and the time they spent on the aircraft type um, that they're currently flying. And usually this is a course that's directed at long haul pilots, X747-400, or indeed the 777, but it's applicable to anybody who is undergoing this transition phase. So if you can imagine, the average person will have probably been flying for 20 years, so we've got 200 years plus up there of aviation experience, and the average time on site will probably be five years. So you've got 50 years. And then I put up my qualifications, if you like. And they amount to just 35 years in aviation, probably 36 now. You know, more like 37, actually, sadly. <laughs> and six years on 747-400. So as a starter for 10, I tell the guys and girls that I brought them here on false pretenses because there's nothing that I can tell you that you don't already know or you haven't already come across. But what I am going to try and do is to put things in a, a perspective or different boxes so as that you can perhaps look at some of these things anew in a way that will be useful to your command. Because success for the day is always that you have walked away from it thinking that it was worthwhile. Recognising that there was something, perhaps, that I've refreshed you in. Something that you didn't know and therefore you've got an opportunity to go away and fill that gap in your knowledge. Or I've offered you a technique, a way of thinking about something that you will find useful in your day-to-day -day aviation activity. So perhaps we better start by introducing me. Um, many of you of course won't know me, uh, but I've been flying for BOC and British Airways now for nearly 34 years. I have been an instructor of one sort or another for over a quarter of a century. And my career path started off as a PX on the 747-400 extra pilot. Um, as it was uh, known then, then uh, oh, about three years on 707, and back on the classic 747, uh, and then I spent some time, stood down, flying for an outfit called Pelican, which was a, an introduction into another world outside the world that we're familiar with in British Airways. Then back onto the classic, and then I went up to Highlands Division, uh, where I took my uh, command uh, and I w was very rapidly appointed Chief Pilot Highlands Division which was the start of my management career 
and I was responsible for a very, very large number of new commands as the division was expanding. I was sent away to Harvard and came back as the head of safety for British Airways. And uh, then I moved on to position as general manager of flight operations until I resigned. And I have spent the interim since that time as a training captain. And now I'm training standards captain in 747 400. Along the way, I have been privileged to observe um, some of the best trainers uh, in the world. I have also seen problems of all sorts in trainees and I have had an opportunity to um, support, help, do my best for um, a number, many, many number of pilots in various forms of transition and indeed managing the upsets and downsets of life in the aviation industry. It's from that experience that um, I tried to put together something that I hope will be of use to you. The background to this course, because we're going to run an agenda that is, as you see on the board, was that when we were up in Highlands Division, we were making up very large numbers of new commanders on a, an aeroplane that was on um, the budgie, which uh, was very poorly equipped, going to very poorly equipped airfields in the worst weather that I've ever come across in my aviation career, with co-pilots who were very inexperienced and brand new captains. And we were expanding because one of the things that I kept out of my CV is that I introduced the ATP into British Airways, something that I'm probably not very proud of. Um, but when we were doing that, we were expanding very, very fast. And we found, although we did no objective research into it, that those pilots who had what I'm going to call good technical knowledge and operational awareness invariably required very little support on the command course to make, in the end, very good captains. And yet, conversely, those people with poor technical knowledge or poor operational knowledge, oper operational awareness, or both, were those that we had to support with the most effort in order to help them achieve their goal and our goal of creating a um, good commander for British Airways. And although that occurred, what we did in Highlands Division is that if they belonged to me and we knew that they were on a command course, they were wheeled into my office and I would challenge them and say, look, you've got between now and then to try to make your technical knowledge better than mine. Your operational awareness of the route and the aircraft better than mine. Because if you do that, you will find that your command course is a walk in the park. And if they didn't belong to me, they got a letter along those sorts of lines. And to a great extent, I was all put in a box and forgotten until I was back on the Classic. And we were getting a large number of uh, new commands from the 747-400. And we were getting serious problems. We were getting failures, and there's nothing more serious than that. And we tried to analyse why. I can remember a standards captain's meeting where one of my colleagues said, you know, these guys know almost nothing about almost everything. And by, what he meant by that was that, you know, if you ask them what is the last minute change fuel procedure, they'd sort of have a vague recollection that there was one. But one, they certainly wouldn't know what it was. And two, and worse, they couldn't find it. Another example uh, occurred when I was in the right-hand seat watching uh, over somebody on his command course. And we were doing our pre-flight preparation. 
no passengers on board just yet, but one of the cabin crew rushed up from the back, Captain, Captain, there's stuff coming out of the end of the wing. And by stuff, what he actually meant was fuel. And so we had, on our hands, a fuel spill. This is great, I thought to myself. I wonder what the good commander's going to do now. Well, the good commander, A, didn't know what to, to do. Secondly, uh, as a greater sin in my book, he didn't know where to find what to do. And the bottom line was that the whole activity in controlling these events was screwed up. Now, what do you think that did for his confidence, having had that sort of um, problem thrown at him with me sitting alongside him? And equally, what did it do in terms of information for me, his training captain, about how well he did or didn't know the operations manual? I would have had no problem at all that he didn't know that there were different procedures, whether the fuel spill was less than two metres or more than two metres. I wouldn't have had any problem if he'd used some common sense initially to ensure that we'd stop boarding, to ensure that we'd stop refueling, to ensure that the fire engines were on the way, and so on and so forth. But he didn't use any of those things. And he was at a loss because he didn't have the knowledge about where to go in the operations manual to get that advice if he needed it. Knowledge is power. If you turn that on its head, if he did know what to do, if he had told me to turn up the procedure and flying crew orders and just review the fact that we had done everything properly together, how much better would have he felt and how much better would have I felt about his process or his progress to command? Now, that was illustrative of a problem. And we put together this course, which I have developed since, in order to try to illustrate the sorts of areas where either you need to know it needs to be up here in random access memory, you need to know where to go to find information for stuff that you're not going to use from random access memory, but you need to know is correct as and when things happen, like, for instance, you've got an unruly passenger and you're thinking about the processes that need to be put in place if you're going to be met by the police or so on, have you. Those aspects of where to go, where to go if you want the de-icing code and so on and so forth. And the general knowledge, general aviation knowledge, what we used to call airmanship, what I still call airmanship, what everybody in this world should be calling airmanship, i.e. the applied common sense, applied common sense in an aviation environment, that will keep you on track, no matter who is trying to push you off the required path. And so from that point of view, Although I am going to have to be, and you're going to have to listen if you like, far too much to me, rather than what we will do in a classroom, which is to get the ideas from round about and develop those ideas together, I'm going to have to ask the question and also answer it. And to that extent, I'm afraid that we'll lose quite a lot of the dynamism that we get when we've got a group of enthusiastic aviators sitting in a room together. Before I start properly, I have to uh, include what I'm going to call a contract and disclaimer. And the reason is I have decided to do this uh, as a part of my <laughs> recovery process on sick leave. I've had my other hip, uh, my second hip, resurfaced and um, I won't go back flying for another month or so. And I've decided to keep both the recording copyright and the material copyright 
for my own protection and indeed for yours. And I'm, I'm going to go through what I will call the boring bit because it is very, very important that you understand that there is a contract between us. That contract arises because for, in order for you to have obtained these discs legitimately, you have sent me a cheque for £10. That £10 is split uh, £2 for the contract between us and £8 for the production of the discs, the package and posting them and getting them to you. You've also agreed, or uh, anyway you've told me, that you are going to send a donation of not less than £10 to a British Airways charity of your choice. In other words, these 10 discs are costing you the grand sum of 20 quid. So, in exchange for this contract, my side of it is that I am going to do my absolute utmost to share with you the sorts of information that are shared routinely in these events when we run a command day and when there is a room full of enthusiastic aviators. Of course, the shortcoming of this medium means to say that uh, I can only do my best in this regard, but in any way I intend to be able to give you some tools, some uh, strategies and subroutines that I hope you will find useful in your progress towards your command and indeed in order to make you more effective in the interim as a co-pilot. I will do my best to highlight those areas where in my experience our colleagues have had the most difficulty along the way in the transition to being an effective commander and to indicate the sorts of things that you might do to make your transition easy or as I'd like to say your command course a walk in the park. You have your side though of this contract and that is that one, you undertake not to copy any of these discs and that you understand that these discs are for your own use and your personal use alone. You will not lend them to anyone and you will not give them away. In fact, you will not let them out of your possession. You will not let them out of your possession. You also undertake not to share any of the concept content of any of the discs with anyone, any third party outside of British Airways. There are other details of the contract that I'm going to put on the board as part of our waiver. But in the meantime, you should know that I have taken the decision that, of course, I could encrypt the discs. But I've decided that in the same way that I have trusted every captain who has worked for me, indeed everybody in British Airways who's worked with me or for me, I am going to trust you to keep your side of this bargain. And the reason is this, that when we give you that fourth gold bar, platinum bar as it is now, British Airways are going to entrust capital equipment worth hundreds of millions of pounds. People and cargo, your crew, which are worth many, many, many times that. And indeed the reputation of British Airways itself. And we're going to entrust that to you solely as someone who is in command of the operation and we're going to insure the whole lot for $850 million. 
Now, if on the one hand we're going to trust you to look after that, I think it is absolutely unreasonable that I can't trust you to keep your side of this bargain. Disclaimer. References to or quotations from published documents, i.e. Air Navigation Order, British Airways Operations Manual, Joint Airworthiness Regulations, etc., are believed to be correct at the time of production of this presentation, late autumn 2004, but are not warranted as such. Any opinions, whether explicitly stated or implied, directly or by context, are those of Captain Colin L. Seaman and his alone. They will always reflect his view and understanding of best aviation practice, given his knowledge, expertise and extensive experience. However, if by omission or commission such opinions differ from a reasonable interpretation of instructions contained in relevant published documents, i.e. Air Navigation Order, British Airways Operation Manual, Joint Air Worthiness Regulations, etc., then those instructions must be considered overriding. Great care has been taken in the production of this presentation set with regard to the accuracy of content and the style and tone of delivery of it. That said, with the absence of two-way dialogue with you, the trainee, it must be clearly understood that it is entirely possible that a misunderstanding of advice, emphasis or methodology could go uncorrected, for which Captain Seaman cannot be held responsible. OK, let's make a start. I spend quite a lot of time in the introduction just, um, if you like, agreeing some rules for the day with a group of people. Mm, and I think it's probably worth just covering those aspects, even though you're going to view this in the privacy of your own home or hotel room or wherever you're going to do this. But the first rule is because I'm going to ask lots and lots of questions and we're going to explore parts of the operations manual that may be sometimes a little bit obscure and I'm going to talk about how to do manual load sheets and all what a certificate of airworthiness means and so on and so forth. But the primary rule is that it's okay, it's okay not to know. And that is in the, the great um, Donald Rumsfeld um, world, you know, the unknown unknowns. I, you don't know what you don't know. And one of the great things that I always get from running this sort of course, or indeed in any training environment, is that I always take something away, something that I didn't know, or something that refreshed me. Oh, I haven't come across that for a while, and so on and so forth. And that is the way to approach it. Because it's very easy to be intimidated by somebody who's going to ask you questions or take you to places in the operations manual and navigation order or wherever that you haven't been for a while. And that's the purpose of this exercise. So if you don't know something, it's okay. You can turn me off, which is great, and go and find it for yourself. It's probably the best way and come back. Or you write it down and make sure that if I found a gap in your knowledge, you fill it. Because the great thing is about like, the language. Here we are in France and I'm learning French. And you've got to forget something five times before you will remember it forever, is what the experts say. So, you know, you'll hear me say standard operating procedures and operations manual many, many, many more times than five in this presentation. And there'll be other things that you need, perhaps, to refresh yourself. Because if we're going to agree that technical knowledge and operational awareness is a vital part of what it is that we bring as commanders to aviation, then this is an opportunity 
it will use me to repair any damage in your operational knowledge or your technical knowledge or to think about bringing to life the words in those manuals. So probably the second part of the rules for the day is an understanding of what is a standard operating procedure. A standard operating procedure is something that you can touch in the operations manual. What is the operations manual? Well, if you turn to section 15 of flight rules, you will find the operations manual listed. And the last time I counted, it stretches to 29 volumes. The operations manual of British Airways stretches to 29 volumes. It's not something that British Airways you know, felt like doing. It is required as part of the air navigation order. In order to be an airline operating under a UK air operator's certificate, you have to have an operations manual. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about what that operations manual has to contain. But most importantly for you and me, it contains the standard operating procedures of British Airways. Standard operating procedures of any airline. You know, are written down in the operations manual. That is different to Colin's preferred way of doing something if the operations manual is silent. Your preferred way of doing something if the operations manual is silent. Because where it is silent you can do, do it any way you like if it gets the required result. But where the operations manual lays down a standard operating procedure, then that is what you and I are required to comply with. And that leads me into a second aspect of a discussion that I have with the guys and girls sitting around the classroom. Who's doing a command on type? And some people put their hand up. Who's doing a command on another type? Okay. The guys and girls doing command on type have some advantages. And they're obvious. They know the aeroplane. Although, as something I used to call the Siemens law, that technical knowledge is inversely, inversely proportional to time on type. I could recognise a wry smile of those that you, of you that recognise what I mean by that, which is that actually your day-to-day -day knowledge of operating the aeroplane is probably not very, needed to be very deep, but actually the knowledge that you need when things go wrong, and indeed the knowledge that you brought when you did the conversion course in the first place, was much greater. But you know the environment, and you know the operation generally, and you're comfortable with flying the aeroplane, because actually the people that worry about, well, I'm changing seats, therefore I'm changing hands, is a nonsense. You don't fly with these, you fly with this. And so as soon as you've re-instructed re or reprogrammed the, the hands, changing seats is an honour event. And those of you who are um, used to um, a heavy pilot operation, are used to finding your way about no select panel um, from both seats. Um, and indeed, for me, sitting left, right seat, it just is of absolutely no consequence. As it won't be of any consequence for you. However, seat change in the aircraft type comes with a huge set of disadvantages and I want you to understand what they are. One, when you come with baggage, the baggage is that you've got used to the way people do things on the fleet and over time the way people do things on the fleet varies quite dramatically 
from the standard operating procedures laid down by British Airways. Two, you have this reluctance to ask questions. And the reluctance comes because sitting alongside someone like me, you think, Christ, I ought to know this. And therefore, you don't ask questions, you don't get that gap in knowledge filled. Whereas if you were changing type, where you know that you're not supposed to know any, anything, the questions are open season. And that's something that's quite difficult, very difficult actually, to overcome the reluctance to ask questions because you are, think that you ought to know. So, rule number two, three, whatever we've got to, is the only silly question. The only silly question is the one that is not asked. The only silly question is the one that is not asked. I and all of my colleagues will jump through hoops and turn somersaults to do everything they possibly can to help you. But unless we ask, we don't know what you don't know. And equally, we're not, most of us aren't anyway, clairvoyant. So I don't know what's going on in your mind. And I don't know where you're unsure of stuff unless you voice it. And if you voice it, I'll do my best. It. And if I can't fill it, my colleagues can't fill it, we'll tell you, we'll find, we'll find it together, we'll find the answer together. <clears throat> because the question asked will always, from a good instructor, get an answer. The only silly question is the one that isn't asked. The <clears throat> advantage of moving aircraft type for your command is of course it's open season for questions. <clears throat> Most importantly, you read the operations manual with no, and that part of the operations manual that I'm referring to in this case is the flying manual and the technical manual, with no preconceived idea of what it says. Because if you're like me, sometimes I can read a page and I read it as I think it's written rather than as it is written. And this is generally what happens when you're on an aircraft time, when you think you know what the, the scan check sequence says, and you've done it a million times, so therefore of course you know. But then you're going to sit alongside me and ask, have you done a time check? And you look at me, I so said, I'm nuts. And say, of course I am. Uh, and I said, well, why is the time on my clock different from the time on your clock? And the, there'll be a failure to recognise that the scan check sequence requires in two parts of the operations manual a requirement for an accurate time check. One, it's in the scan check, check, scan check sequence itself. And two, it's in the root information manual if you're going to a scheduled nav area. And then I'll ask, well, do you know how to check the time? And you'll be amazed at the number of people that do not know on GPS-equipped aircraft. You can go and ask the satellite what the time is through the ACMS. If you're not on a GPS-equipped aeroplane, then you can tune up on the HF, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. You can tune into Colorado, where the good Americans will tell you that at the tone, the time will be 2.37 universal coordinated time, beep, which then gives you a time check. Or, of course, if you are in London, then you can bring one, two, three on your mobile phone and you'll get a time check of Tim. Now, tiny, silly little example, but illustrates the point that when you're coming to a new aircraft, you tend to read all of those things and you are fresh and you get them right. When you're doing a seat change, then you've got this sort of mental approach. Well, I know what it says and very often you get it wrong. So it is very important to understand that 
So guys that are sitting alongside you, guys and girls are sitting alongside you as training counselors, are interested in two things. One, you know what the standard operating procedure is. And two, you're going to apply it. Standard operating procedure, something you can touch in the operations manual. It gives me immense pleasure when somebody will smile at me on his command calls and say, we're just checking out flight technical dispatch. And he says, Colin, I know your license will be valid for the period of time that we're away. With a smile on his face. Why? Well, what he's told me is he knows what the ops manual says. He's applied it. And furthermore, He's intelligent enough to realise it's not it's something that we haven't yet got round to cancelling out of our operations manual because given the systems that we have in place it is nonsensical for the captain to be asking for people's licences to check that they're valid. Actually the vast majority of pilots wouldn't know how to check a licence, which is another aspect, but you get the drift. Or something like, I know you'll have a torch, Colin. Yeah, of course I have a bloody torch because the operations manual requires it. But equally, funnily enough, it is a requirement in the operations manual and it is a captain's responsibility. And you see where I'm coming from on that. So the baggage, if you're doing a seat change on an aircraft type, is something that you need to be aware of. Because I couldn't give a stuff and I could have neither could any of my colleagues, what the normal, if you like, shorthand procedure is for doing things on the aeroplane. I am only interested in your application of the procedures that are laid down by British Airways in their operations manual and your willingness and ability to apply them based on your knowledge. So let's take a moment to decide how we're going to run the rest of this presentation. If you've been with me in any training activity, you will know that if a student provides me with a hook, I'll hang something on it, a training hook, I call it. And to, his, to all intents and purposes, these titles are hooks for me to develop themes. Uh, so I generally start with what I call handling hints and tips, talking about um, some aspects of uh, handling the aeroplane. And of course I need to emphasise that um, throughout the handling exercises, the technical review, I'm going to talk about the 747-400. If you are viewing this, from, if you like, another perspective because you're on the 777 or the Airbus 737, uh, then you will be able to draw parallels, but of course you will not be able to use the specifics necessarily that are appropriate to the 400. So, to some extent, less use in that area. But, once again, I emphasise this is for me to uh, develop some themes which are common to operation of all aircraft, really. The technical review, uh, again, is a means by which I can develop themes about how one might handle uh, degradation of airworthiness, um, issues around emergencies, abnormalities, and so on and so forth. And then we go into what I call operational awareness. And this covers a whole raft of things, such as fuel policy, air safety in British Airways, weather minima, um, uh, load sheets, the airplane uh, maintenance log as we call it, or technical log as it's called in the air navigation order, and so on and so forth. Uh, then we will talk about the specific role of the commander where I'm going to develop themes uh, very close to my heart about the issues of le leadership, about the uh, conduct of commanders, on how you can make a difference, how what you do day in and day out uh, really has an effect on positively or negatively on British Airways bottom line. 
and we'll develop the, those sorts of issues um, together. I will then perhaps touch relatively succinctly on some aspects of route flying to try to encourage you to recognize that the role of an effective commander is all about making time and space. It's what I call being selfish with time and space. If you think about any aviation activity, if you've got time to do it, space to do it, if you're flying, then nothing is ever difficult. And yet, conversely, if you're pressed for time, or you haven't got the space because you're too high, too fast, then things become difficult. And so I'm going to develop uh, some ideas about how um, you might uh, to develop for yourself a methodology of being selfish with time and space. So then, in your command, you'll be like the proverbial swan s swimming against a fast-moving current. Serenity on the uh, upside, if you like, where everybody can see you, but paddling like hell underwater. And lastly, I'm going to touch on one or two of the issues that I cover, and it used to be covered very formally, certainly was when I got my command, now perhaps less formally and usually by the individual who bestows the command on you, but to cover some um, items that I think you should be aware of early on in your uh, aviation career as a commander when for that period of time when somebody says oh, will you sign this captain you find yourself looking around for someone else <laughs>